Can you hear me all right? Uh, stand up if you can't. <laughs> uh, it's my honor to be invited to be here today. Thank you so much to be with a group of people that are passionate about children's emotional uh, and social development. Um, I'm going to go quickly uh, through uh, some of the journeys that I have had in trying to bring the incredible years to scale. Now, I think I have to know how to lose this. Press this one. No? Right button. Right button. All right. So the Incredible Years has developed a number of different programs. We actually have um, seven different programs for parents, uh, two programs for promoting uh, children's social and emotional development, one prevention one and one treatment one and a program for training teachers in how to promote children's social and emotional development. If you look at this, this is what I think of as the incredible years building blocks for promoting children's social and emotional development. At the bottom, I don't know if there's a little thing on here or not. Yes, first time I've done this. Wow, okay, so you can see what we would call, what Lauren would talk about, the core ingredients. Uh, these programs for parents are each based on uh, the different developmental stage of the child, and they would be considered the core parenting program according to the age. The second level of blocks are uh, adjuncts to the parent program. So, for example, the advanced parenting program includes, it's given after the basic or the core program, but it includes uh, interpersonal issues for the parents, such as anger management, uh, depression management, and problem solving. And then these are the treatment and prevention child programs and the teacher program. Now, each of these programs can be used independently, but our research has shown that when they're used together, they have additive effects. Um, so I think that's important. They're all, some, they're all thematically uh, consistent uh, programs um, in terms of their developmental framework. The short-term goals of the program are to improve parent-child relationships, to decrease harsh discipline, and to promote parent support systems uh, with other parents, with community, and with teachers. The aim of that is to uh, strengthen children's social and emotional development and reduce conduct problems in young children with the long-term vision or goals to reduce delinquency, substance abuse, uh, and uh, school dropout. We've done a number of studies. We started our studies with the treatment of children with conduct problems and uh, ADHD. Uh, we've done eight randomized controlled trials and there have been at least six independent replications showing that we were able to achieve the changes we hypothesized in terms of improvements in parent-child interactions and reductions in conduct problems. And for at least two-thirds of the children we see uh, in our uh, three, uh, one to three year follow-ups and our ten year follow-ups um, sustainability in our results. Uh, then we went into prevention to see if we could take this program to a selective population. In this case it was high, high risk families in Head Start or in schools addressing greater than 80 percent free lunch. Uh, and we found very similar findings in terms of improvements of children behaviors uh, by uh, supporting their parenting skills to be more positive and less harsh. We took the program, the treatment program, to the children directly in the treatment model uh, by evaluating the child program. Here, oftentimes, the parents would be in the group and the children would be in a group at the same time. Uh, three randomized control trials showed, and one replication showed increases in the children's social and emotional development, problem solving, and reductions in conduct problems at home and school. Again, we tried this out in the schools uh, in Head Starts and uh, primary and first grade to see what changes we could get with selected population. And we've had two randomized controlled trials and, and uh, no, no replications yet, showing similar findings, increases in school readiness, emotional regulation, and reduction in behavior problems. Uh, the teacher program, uh, one where we involved the teachers when we were training the parents and teachers with kids with conduct problems. And I think the significant finding here is that 
when the teacher program was combined with either the child program or the parent program, we saw enhanced improvements in the children's behaviors in the classroom, both in terms of academic outcomes, social outcomes, and reductions in behavior problems in the classroom. Uh, for those of you who would like to see more research, you can check out the website for the different studies. Um, we also uh, looked at taking the teacher program prevention-wise in terms of training. We've done two randomized trials here, and there have been seven replications uh, to have the teachers uh, trained in classroom management skills, which has reducted, uh, reduced uh, classroom aggression and increased children's pro-social behaviors. Where are the programs being delivered? They're in a variety of settings, uh, including Head Start centers, primary grade schools, mental health centers. Uh, Toronto in Canada has taken it to the public health nurses, and they're uh, partnering with mental health agencies to deliver the program. Uh, at jails, homeless shelters, a variety of places. Um, there also is a home visiting model of the program, which has been used with the Native American population in California. Businesses have started offering this as benefits for their employees. And doctor's offices, we'll hear about that from Ellen Perrin a little bit later. Agency barriers, I want to talk about three types of barriers. Agency barriers, commission barriers, and financial barriers. Maybe they're all related to the third, not sure after your conversation this morning. Uh, the um, first is the uh, inadequate agency readiness, that they don't have their, their short or long-term goals clearly <coughs> mapped out. They fail to select clinicians who are really interested and motivated and have the necessary background to deliver the program. Really haven't thought about the what is needed for recruitment and, and engagement in families is particularly important for group-based programs. And the inadequate agency support in terms of uh, handling the logistics of daycare for, for the children while the parents are in groups, meals, uh, room locations, uh, excuse me, scheduling. In addition, some of the barriers include the a failure to provide the clinicians with adequate training or ongoing coaching after the initial training. The uh, temptation is strong and often happens to reduce the program dose and the number of sessions. There's no agency champion there who is an expert in the program or can monitor fidelity of program delivery. They largely in this country don't support clinician accreditation which is different in other countries, and oftentimes have uh, uh, no long-term vision in terms of thinking about how they are going to sustain the program or develop their own internal support system. Clinician barriers are somewhat related. Um, to clinicians who don't have the background in cognitive social learning theory or development, uh, child development, or group work um, find themselves floundering. They don't have ongoing consultation, coaching, or supervision after they have their initial workshop and are un really unsure about how to tailor the program to different populations. They have a poor understanding of what it means to deliver an evidence-based program, and some, I will say, are resistant to the group model. Uh, it's not what they've been trained in. It's not what they're accustomed to, and they're used to seeing families on an individual basis. Funding barriers are um, notably the group or prevention or uh, interventions or treatment interventions are not billable. They might be as an individual therapy, but not as a group therapy. Uh, places have been given early grant or foundation funding, but when the funding ends, the program dies because this, the funding is not sustained. Uh, there's inadequate funds to provide the clinician training or consultation by accredited mentors or clinicians. I have seen supervision provided, but by people who don't know the program. Uh, and there's an inability to afford the full dosage program. Usually it's reduced, and they don't have the capability of thinking about add-on components for particular populations. For example, adding on the advanced program for the child welfare referred families that need more on depression and anger management and so on 
or to at-home visits, which is also what we recommend in our state uh, for our child welfare referred families. Some of these barriers probably pertain to all evidence-based programs, but some specific to the incredible years are that prep time for doing a group intervention is longer than for a one-on-one -on -one intervention, but I will say groups are more efficient. Um, potential delays in starting groups while you get a group together to get started uh, with your group and getting adequate numbers for a group. Rural areas prevent, uh, present challenges in forming groups and when you have group, you need to provide daycare and food for groups and sometimes just the commitment of a group, lar of a room large enough for a group is an issue that stops people in their tracks. Scaling up with the fidelity, I think about it, and I liked the, the metaphor we heard earlier. Um, it is a build, building project. Um, and if you think about a building project, you have the architect. In this case, with evidence base, it's the developer. And I actually think the developers have the easiest job of all. Um, and after that, you have your contractor, who is your agency administrator, who is trying to t decide what program to use and how to go about it. And under that, I hope that we would have our project managers and our foremen. When in our case, we call those the uh, Incredible Years mentor or the Incredible Years coach. And next, you have your builders or your construction team. And these are the clinicians who are delivering the program and your family and your community. Now, if any of these le links are inadequately prepared or educated or funded, the building will fail without doubt. I'm going to talk about eight key building blocks for disseminating incredible years with Fidelity uh, fairly quickly. Um, the first one is organizational readiness, which we talked about a little bit. We try to help the people who contact us prioritize their needs, identify their target population. Uh, we help them by helping them uh, complete what we have is called an incredible years agency readiness. Uh, questionnaire to see whether this is really the right program for them. To help them select an, evid an evidence-based program, sometimes we refer them to different evidence-based programs. We don't think ours is the right, right one for them. And to talk with those who are experts in implementation and making their decisions. Involving the clinicians and community in their decision-making is key. And determining the goodness of fit between the organization, clinician, and community goals and the program philosophy in this case to see whether the Incredible Years one is the philosophy that fits for them. Readiness includes their thinking about their managerial support and understanding, looking at workload commitment for their clinicians. Are their clinicians, do they have the adequate qualifications? How many times I've sent somebody who's been trained with, an education, with, a, with a high school education and nothing further because they think this is simple. Um, and having the adequacy of resources to provide the food that are needed, because we do evening groups for dinner, for transportation, for daycare, books for the parents, and so on, often they don't have those resources. How to help them how to plan recruitment and referral <coughs> strategies. The second key building block is assuring quality training. That is, that they have at least two group leaders or clinicians per group they provide, that are provided with authorized accredited training. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. They just pick somebody to take the program and train someone else. Allowing them continued time for study, preparation, and consultation after they've had their three-day workshop. 99% of the time doesn't happen. Developing a realistic time for training and phase in. The third building block is to provide the clinicians with ongoing quality feedback and consultation. This is outside consultation uh, with people who are accredited, accredited coaches, accredited mentors or trainers. This can be provided in terms of telephone consultations and we recommend a lot of this for their first group, as well as group consultation where they look at the ta tapes of their sessions together and give feedback to each other an individual videotape session feedback um, of their group sessions. The fourth tool is developing the clinician peer support networks within the agencies themselves. We might talk about it as scaffolding 
for your builders. Video, we recommend that group leaders or clinicians videotape their sessions right from the start. Sometimes we have to work with them about human subjects on this. Uh, regular peer site clinician support is really important. So we want the clinicians to meet together, to look at their group sessions together, give feedback to each other, and we provide standardized group process checklists for them to know what to look for, to see whether they're delivering those things. We always recommend two clinicians per group, and if they do this, they can begin when they bring on new clinicians, pair the new clinician with the experienced clinician, so they're getting support from the start. The fifth building tool is to adhere to program fidelity. That is to follow the program protocols. There's protocols for all of the sessions um, to deliver the full dosage of the program, or at least what we say is the minimum dosage, because our research has shown that the longer the dosage, the higher the effect size and most want to reduce it or cut it up in some way. They plan, we ask them to plan for makeup sessions when they're missed from groups and to work with them to allow some flexibility in the program so that they can tailor it adequately with fidelity to the population. Our treatment protocols, for example, are longer than our prevention protocols, but oftentimes in prevention you do get uh, very high-risk families that need more time or you're using uh, translators and you need more time. So many times they're stuck with 10 sessions, period, that's it, all we can do. Um, we try to talk with them right from the beginning, but then you need a different program than ours if you can't do that. Adding supplemental programs as needed for the population, such as the advanced program. The sixth dissemination tool is that we do have a I will say rigorous, pretty rigorous accreditation process that includes the review of the protocols, their attendance, their peer and self-evaluation, their consumer satisfaction evaluations, and DVDs of their actual sessions that have to be signed off and, and proven uh, 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 certifiable, if you will. This process, I do believe, um, allows for the clinician to continue to learn and improve in the program and promotes the fidelity of their delivery. I think that one of the reasons our program has had such good replication by others is largely due to the uh, accreditation process as well as the detailed manuals, the authorized trainings, and the well-defined protocols. The seventh tool is the um, helping the agencies develop a supportive infrastructure to begin to promote the sustainability. If you have an inter internal agency champion or advocate, it can assure that there is clinician peer review support and that they get outside consultation when they need it. Agency uh, administrators should be promoting accreditation so they need to really understand the process and why it's important. So we have developed a training for agency administrators. The development of an, uh, if you get accredited clinicians, then from that group you can pick accredited coaches and accredited mentors so that you have the capacity eventually within your own agency to provide ongoing training and support to assure continued fidelity. The eighth uh, dissemination tool is helping the uh, agencies itself to develop their own quality assurance and evaluation. That is that they are engaged in the process of monitoring group leader fidelity, their consumer satisfaction evaluations, their accreditation. They do pre and post evaluations, which they look at and assess their needs, and they have ongoing contact with our office for continuing education and support. The Incredible Years office does uh, review the accreditation applications. It helps agencies pick mentors and coaches, provides ongoing training for the mentors. We meet once a year uh, for three days so that their mentors are continuing to get support. We review all workshop uh, protocols and evaluations, and we're continually updating and developing and improving the programs, um, consulting with the agencies um, to assure that 
programs are developed with Fidelity. Factors that I think promote Fidelity dissemination are the cost uh, is fairly cheap, it's culturally collaborative, so it's cost effective. Um, the peer coaches and mentors make the program more widely available. The accreditation process fosters Fidelity. We scaled up in over 15 countries throughout the world and many, we have many mentors in these countries. In the United States, we've trained over 12,000 uh, clinicians. Of these, over 7,000 were in the parenting program. The delivery of the program is in most of the states, but those who have the little yellow sunshine on them are those we might call evidence-based places, where they are working on accreditation for their clinicians and have some coaches and in some cases some mentors. And I will, oh, I perhaps don't have time for this, but want you to just know that California is doing an outstanding job. They have a billing for Medi-Cal um, and have a, an infrastructure set up where they review outcomes. The Children's Hospital is training pre and post docs in the program and providing, they have provided mentors. Morrison Center uh, is an agency itself who has taken all of these factors on and are looking at very good outcomes for 77% of the children with reductions in behavior problems. You'll hear about other, one other site of these today, Invest in Kids, who will tell you about that. And finally, I'll, I'll close with we stay focused, I think these are the principles, stay focused on the goal be persistent despite, despite the many barriers and the resistance. Collaborative teamwork is really where it's, where it's at, uh, as well as the individual responsibility. Programs need ongoing remodeling based on feedback, research, and the setting where we're delivering them. Personal connections are everything, and certainly it can't be done with a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, this is, <laughs> these are our mentors. I have to mention a picture of the mentors because they all have on their building aprons.